Tesla investors, listen up. Elon Musk just dropped one of the biggest teasers I've ever seen him do, whilst also expanding the robo-taxi geofence in rather comical fashion ahead of what most speculators expected. Hans, firstly, the teaser, Elon wrote on Twitter, just left the Tesla design studio, most epic demo ever by end of year, ever. Hans, what do you think this could be? Well, that certainly does sound exciting. I sure wish we knew for certain what Elon was thinking here. Um, I think there are probably three distinct possibilities and I'll just kind of maybe go in reverse order of likelihood. I think, you know, obviously Tesla's got a lot of irons in the fire right now. One of those things could certainly be impressive progress on the Optimus robot, whether that demo has to do with maybe useful work in a factory, potentially exceptional capabilities by the actuator team, uh, particularly if it has to do with the hands. That's one of the big challenges that the Optimus robot project has right now. And uh, I think we'll get into that a little bit more later in the show. But that's definitely one possibility. I think that would have some of the most epic implications for the long-term value of Tesla if we can see just incredible performance there on that front. Although, you know, I think that's probably not one of the things that's most likely, A, because making hands that really are on par with what we have as humans is still a very, very, very difficult robotics challenge, um, even just from a pure mechanical standpoint. And um, I think that's a project that's further out on Tesla's roadmap. And so then if we bring it in a little bit closer, obviously they're also working on the CyberCab. And that is going to be, you know, another huge project that has a lot of potential to boost revenue for Tesla. And so I think that could be another thing that Elon is talking about here that, hey, you know, we're going to have an awesome cyber cab demo of all the things that it can do. But honestly, I think, you know, like I said, both of those two things are much less likely than the obvious choice, which is the Roadster. It's something that Elon has been talking about for quite a while. We've been hinted at and teased on the Roadster for a long time, many, many years. And it is going to be an exciting product when it comes to its speed and then whatever they've done with this SpaceX package to potentially make it levitate and, you know, a lot of different things. That would be, I think, the thing that most people are expecting this demo to be. Uh, it's probably going to be consensus among some of the very, you know, uh, staunch Tesla nerds. And it is one of the things that, I mean, it is definitely time, like either we need to release the Roadster or give everyone back their money and just move on and say, okay, you know what, never mind. This was a waste of time. But I think as a Halo product, it really is something that's worth doing at some point in the near future. And um, I think right now might be a good time for that product in the overall product cycle. And um, so that's what I'm hoping for. I th it's what I think is the most likely here for what Elon is talking about. I mean, just imagine like a car that can shatter even the performance of the Plaid, which has been surpassed, you know, by a couple of other cars recently in terms of its top speed, its acceleration, um, some of those things that Tesla has an opportunity here to just reclaim the leaderboard in a whole bunch of different performance metrics, you know, zero to 60 in one second instead of 1.9 seconds, that kind of, you know, crazy thing, you know, much higher top speed, farther range, you know, better track times around Nürburgring and all of these things. Um, you know, that's something that we expect the new Tesla Roadster to be able to accomplish. And uh, it's just time for them to actually deliver. Elon also just dropped another nugget on Optimus. Optimus 3 will have agility roughly equal to an agile human. Firstly, Hans, are you finding Optimus's rate of improvement impressive? And secondly, Elon predicted that Tesla might have produced 5,000 humanoid robots by the end of the year. If that's the goal, don't you think we should start seeing some evidence of that soon? To answer the first part of your question, I absolutely do find the rate of progress of Optimus very, very impressive. This is an extremely challenging product and project. 
And the fact that Tesla has gotten into this space, it really validated the space and has kicked off, you know, a whole lot of competition, not only domestically here in the United States with companies like Figure or One X, but then also in China as well uh, with a whole host of other manufacturers and uh, people all really trying to work on this problem. Now, with that said, yes, this project is moving extremely rapidly and they are making great strides, but I still don't think that it's going to move as fast as a lot of Tesla enthusiasts are expecting. And to be honest, I don't expect to see that 5,000 Optimus robots produced this year either that Elon was hoping for. So I think we're probably gonna be a little bit delayed on some of those things. And the reason for that is that this is just, like I said earlier, an incredibly challenging project. There was a great conversation that James Dalman and Scott Walter had this last week on uh, Brighter with Herbert. And they were really talking about the difficulty in really making actuators that are capable of driving these humanoid robots at the type of agility uh, power and then reliability that humans do that, you know, these things really, in order to be very useful, they need to be highly reliable and they need to be low cost. And in order to be highly reliable and low cost, you need to be able to achieve huge manufacturing scale. And, um, there isn't really any of the humanoid robot makers who are using actuators that can be produced at the scale of, you know, millions and millions of actuators. Yet all of these things are much more in the prototyping phase. And so the manufacturing processes that are being employed to make these actuators are much more like prototypes than they are, you know, mass production processes. And so that is, you know, that's one of the big challenges that's going to be a gating factor here on what we can do. And then especially when you apply that to the hands, like I mentioned earlier, that, you know, we've got very, very capable hands as humans. It's, you know, one of the marvels of biology and evolution that you can have so much power and sensitivity and strength and dexterity in, in the human hand. And, you know, we're able to accomplish that by having lots and lots of musculature in our forearms and then tendons that come up here and do this. And then between the combination of that and our nerves and, you know, the complex joints in our wrists and in the rest of our hands, it's just really, a, you know, a marvel. And there isn't anything that we have, you know, in the robotic space that has that type of flexibility. And if you want a humanoid robot to actually be a drop-in replacement for humans and be able to do as many general tasks as we do, you know, having hands that are as capable as human hands is a big part of that. And um, yeah, the, you know, we've seen the step forward to the 22 degree of freedom hand design that Tesla has shown off. We haven't seen much on that since then. I'm sure they're making good progress and they don't really want to, you know, tip their hand, uh, pun only slightly unintended there too much. But that said, you know, whatever those actuators and cabling systems and things are going to be, I, I just don't think we're really close yet to a full solution that even works at the prototype level at the, um, you know, capability that we have, much less than be able to have all of the mass manufacturing challenges solved uh, in order to really start to scale this in a huge, huge way. So, yeah, I think we're probably at least maybe a year behind on the, uh, well, maybe not a year behind on the 5,000 unit metric, but definitely behind uh, on when we will get those 5,000 robots. Elon's tweet though, or his post really is a good indication that they are making good progress. Um, I think, you know, the core difference between an Optimus 2.5 and an Optimus 3 is clearly and obviously going to be those actuators. You know, a lot of that agility that Elon is speaking to there has to come from the actuators themselves. And so um, that's the, the core engineering challenge that is at play here. And it sounds like Tesla's making really good progress on those things. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like. I'm hopeful that they're able to create 
novel actuator designs that really simplify the manufacturing processes that are necessary in order to manufacture these actuators that are you know highly reliable highly precise um repeatable and then easy to make and make in high high volume you know i think if the Optimus 3 looked exactly like Optimus 2.5, but it had significantly improved actuators. That alone would be, you know, more than enough to justify a 2.5 to 3 uh, version upgrade. And I really am hopeful that that is, you know, what is going on behind the scenes because those are, you know, those are the big, big challenges. On the software side of things, you know, I think that we're going to have ways to program these things to be extremely useful. Um, I think, you know, I definitely defer to James Dalma's expertise on this here that the software is hard, but it's not as hard as the hardware challenge. And um, so I'm looking forward to seeing something from tesla and you know if the crazy impressive demo that elon is talking about does end up being an optimus demo by the end of the year it certainly wouldn't hurt my feelings because this is definitely the biggest opportunity that tesla has before it and there is you know stiff competition a lot of different people that are trying to enter into this space and win and uh so you know we don't have quite the luxury of time with the optimus project that we have had with some of the other things that tesla has been getting into in classic Elon Musk style, he's rather humorously just expanded Tesla's robo-taxi network. Most people thought we were going to be waiting longer until this happened, but no, it's come through. How significant is this? And also, how significant is it that it's been conducted in this rather funny way? The suggestion to make the geofence in this rather phallic way was only made around two weeks before going live. There has to be some signal in that. There's definitely some strong signal in this indeed. I, I would agree with that. You know, CERN Basher actually had a really good post on this today, and he really highlighted three different um, key takeaways from what this very, very humorous expansion of the network implies. And so first of all, you know, we saw, I think it was Nick Cruz Patane on July 2nd, was posting about Tesla running some very specialized vehicles around in downtown Austin that we assumed were for validation of the RoboTaxi uh, network. And it looks to be that that was in fact true. And so, you know, it's only been about two weeks since we saw Tesla doing these validation drives in the area that they were looking to expand into. And now the service is live in that area. And we've already seen those same vehicles driving down as far south as Kyle, Texas, which I think is basically as far south as the, uh, the northern end of the expansion area under the new geofence, this geofence probably won't continue to look as humorous as it does for very much longer because we're probably going to get new area. Um, and then we've also seen vehicles not just here in Texas, but also operating in California and in some other areas. And so I would say the, the first and most important takeaway from this is that they are willing to expand the coverage area of the robo taxi very, very rapidly. Now, we haven't seen them take away safety drivers. We haven't seen them significantly expand the fleet as of yet and so you know they still do have some limitations on how much risk they're willing to expose the service to but they are expanding the service area very rapidly and then i expect some of these other things to also fall away you know that there's probably some threshold of just total miles that they have that they want to have these human safety drivers for and that once they reach that threshold of total miles then they're willing to and they you know the data supports the fact that those safety drivers haven't seen uh, safety critical incidents that they needed to intervene on at a, a rate that's more than, you know, one tenth of what uh, human drivers would have in that same time frame or those same number of miles, then they'll probably will go ahead and remove those safety drivers. And so um, I, I do expect to see the safety drivers stick around for a while. So really then the next important thing is how fast are we expanding the, the coverage area, the service area? How fast are we expanding the fleet? And really both of those two things are kind of proxies for the one metric we really wanna see. And that is just how many RoboTaxi miles have been driven. That's going to be the core metric that really everything else is based off of. That will be a direct correlation to 
you know, safety data implications. That'll be a direct correlation to how fast is the overall service expanding. And it'll give us quite a bit of insight into where the robo taxi service is headed over time as it tries to eat into, you know, the total miles that are driven by humans for, you know, general passenger transport here in the United States, um, because that is the first big market that Tesla robo taxi is attacking. One of the other things that this really highlights, you know, because they were able to just make the shape this very uh very entertaining shape in just a short period of time after Stephen Mark Ryan suggested that you know that shows that they don't have the types of limitations that Waymo has in having to have these super highly developed HD maps for the areas that they cover you know these cars that Nick uh, has videoed traveling around that are doing these validation drives, they're not creating HD maps. They're just validating that the things are in the map where the Tesla thinks that they are based on when they have driven through those same areas with just cameras. And so once they have said, yes, you know, we believe that the map that we have created is an accurate representation of what's really here, then they're able to go live with their service in that area. And they can do that quickly you know this isn't a process that takes them months and months and months or even weeks and weeks and weeks and tons and tons of capital in order to do um, and so they can pretty much expand their service area at will in whatever shape that they want to in whatever area that they want to and that does have significant implications for the fact that this is a general solution to the self-driving problem. This is not something that is highly, highly engineered and requires all sorts of crutches and engineering workarounds in order to solve. And, you know, the last thing that he pointed out is that obviously, you know, everyone on the internet now is talking about this today. And so this is a huge marketing and strategic win for X and for Tesla and for Elon and for RoboTaxi that, you know, this is like classic guerrilla marketing. If you do something that is very, very memeable, then uh, you'll get a lot of earned attention here. And it's also going to be funny just to watch the mainstream media have to actually cover this. And, uh, you know, are they going to show this? Are they not going to show this? Is it going to be a wink and a nod? All of that really, you know, just makes this even more funny. But um, yeah, I, I think this is obviously, you know, one of the big implications that I'm taking away from this is, like I said, just the speed at which they're expanding this service area that, you know, it's only been a couple weeks since we saw those validation drivers, but even beyond that, it's been less than a month since they launched the service and they're basically doubling the total square miles that they're covering here. And if they're willing to add, you know, essentially that original coverage area every three to four weeks, then it's not going to be very long, probably within a matter of months, maybe within inside of a year, you know, six months, 12 months, 18 months maximum, that Tesla's service area will actually encompass more total square miles than Waymo encompasses today. And, um, you know, they'll be growing so fast and able to then supply not only, you know, the the coverage area, but the cars to, to cover all those areas to where they can completely eviscerate Waymo and the number of paid miles that Waymo operates on a daily basis. Um, Tesla has the opportunity to surpass that within the next 18 months and do that at a rate where they'll be growing far faster than anything that Waymo can grow. And, uh, you know, that divergence will be something that is plain and obvious for anyone and everyone to see. And, you know, once they eclipse Waymo, then it'll be a comparison to Uber. And, uh, you know, we'll be watching Uber and Lyft steadily decline as well. And uh, that's what we're looking forward to. I think that all starts to become extremely, extremely obvious here in the coming year to 18 months. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. I'm looking forward to continuing to observe and cover this area. It's going to be an insane time for investors.